Hey everyone, welcome to the USGS Landslide Hazards Seminar. I'm Steve Slaughter, and this meeting is hosted by the Landslide Hazards Program. The seminar is a presentation by researchers, academics, students, and professional geologists from private industry and government agencies who are working on some aspect of landslide and landslide science. The seminar is organized by Matt Thomas, Jamie Kostelnik, and me. The presentation is about 50 minutes long. At the end, you can submit questions via the chat window or use the raise your hand feature in combination with your microphone and video camera. We typically wait until the end of the presentation to take questions. Uh, during the presentation, please remember to keep your microphone and cameras turned off. Today's speaker is Rex Baum from the USGS, and he's introduced by Bill Scholes from the USGS. Bill? Thanks, Stephen. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker. Stephen already took that away from me, Rex Baum. <laughs> um, Rex is a research geologist in the Landslide Hazards Program of the U.S. Geological Survey, and he's currently chief of the Landslide Initiation Processes and Probability Project, but uh, I'd argue that he's essentially led the landslide project, at least during the past two decades that I've been with the, with the USGS. Um, Rex was educated as a geologist and an engineering geologist with a focus on landslides, so he's perfect for this role. Um, he performed graduate studies at the University of Cincinnati, where he studied with the late Arvid Johnson, receiving his PhD in 1988. Um, while at the USGS, Rex has performed important research on landslide processes, uh, landslide forecasting and warning, he has a very broad education skill set that ranges from geotechnics to detailed engineering geologic field studies, monitoring and modeling. And I'm particularly fond of his research into landslide kinematics, internal stresses, and surface deformation that reveals those other uh, aspects that are important in landslide controls, and also his uh, studies on deformation of landslides as they move and consequent forced groundwater circulation that partly controls landslide speed. Of course, these days, I think he's very widely known around the world for his research on transient rainfall infiltration effects on pore water pressure and slope stability, both at the local and regional scale, uh, especially with the model triggers that he's developed for um, forecasting uh, effects of, of rainfall on pore water pressure and slope stability. And that model has been used internationally for regional landslide hazard assessments. In addition, Rex has also performed and led many hazard assessments from essentially the day he started at the USGS, where he focused on uh, snow induced landslide disasters in central Utah. But since then, he's studied all over the Rocky Mountain region, as well as back in the Midwest and Ohio, in California, Hawaii, the Pacific Northwest, more recently in Puerto Rico, and um, in the past in Poland and El Salvador as well. I've really been fortunate to work with Rex for the past 20 years and watch as he set a perfect example for landslide scientists at the USGS, essentially checking all of the boxes for supporting the mission of the Landslide Hazards Program. And today he'll talk about some important improvements to his triggers model that I'm sure will have people excited for future hazard assessment application. Uh, thanks, Rex. Thank you, Bill. Um, I don't don't quite know how to follow that uh, introduction. Thank you. That was uh, very generous. Um, I want to take the opportunity uh, today to uh, talk about uh, developments uh, in landslide assessments over the last roughly five decades. Um, so starting from before my career started, actually, and uh, Hey Rex, you may want to turn your video off. But you're just kind of okay. herky jerky right now. Okay. Well, I was a little herky jerky there, trying to figure out where <laughs> <laughs> how to get things to work right. So let me see if I can. Um, okay. Got the camera turned off. Okay. Yeah, and you're still in full screen. It looks good. You're in slide historical pers perspectives. Okay. Let's see, let me go back. All right, so yeah, um, my talk is in three parts. I'm gonna give some historical perspectives uh, first. I'm really uh, just looking at some of the early developments in um, uh, landslide assessments, uh, and then gonna jump up to the present. Um, and I'm sorry, I've got an, <clears throat> 
echo, so I'm going to close my door. I'll be right back. OK, that's better. Um, so wanting to take a look back in the past to see. Um, kind of help us see why we're we're where we're at today and uh, maybe take a, a peek a little bit into the future as to directions we might want to go. So this is not not a comprehensive review. And it's certainly not uh, a summary of of my career. I'm mainly going to be talking about other people's work during this. This uh, historical review here. I want to start with a few definitions. So first of all, an assessment. What I mean by that is an estimate of of the prospect, or in other words, the probability or uh, possibility that uh, something will happen. Susceptibility with regard to landslides is a state of being likely to be affected or harmed by an event. And zonation is a term that I'll use on some upcoming slides. And so that has to do with <clears throat> dividing land up into areas and ranking them by degree. And so here we have an example. Uh, there's a little piece of uh, Earl Brab's map from 1972, one of the early landslide susceptibility maps. And um, it's broken down numerically number one being the least susceptible area and Roman numeral six being the most susceptible with the exception of L, which is landslide deposits. And those are, um, of course, absolutely the most susceptible in this uh, map that he, he made. Uh, as far as the assess, assessment or estimate of uh, likelihood that landslides would occur, that was based on uh, percentages of the uh, rocks being um, affected by landslides and so that the uh, tall uh, figure over to the right of the screen shows the breakdown of percentage of, of uh, outcrop area affected by landslides. Um, and that corresponds to the, the different zones. Roman numerals one through six plus L. So that's what we're that's part of what we're going to be talking about today. Also going to <clears throat> review some uh, concepts about hazard and risk. So when we talk about the term natural hazard, uh, we're really talking about a probability of a potentially damaging phenomenon, um, and it's going to be limited to a specific time period and specific area. Um, vulnerability uh, is the degree of loss that's going to result given the magnitude of whatever this damaging phenomenon is. Uh, elements at risk are things like people, um, buildings, utilities, and so on. And then the total risk is the product of the elements at risk uh, times the vulnerability and the uh, natural hazard. And there's an implied summation there because vulnerability is going to vary for each element at risk. Uh, and <clears throat> this information is simplified uh, from uh, David Varnes 1984 paper um, in which he reviewed uh, landslide zonation and state of the art up to that point in time. So let's look at some early ideas. I'm going to first talk about some in a related field of landslide warning. 
uh, and then I'm going to uh, just on one slide, and then I'm going to talk to some parallel developments for um, landslide zonation. Um, so about 1969, there were a series of storms that affected the Los Angeles area. Uh, in 1975, Russ Campbell of the USGS published a professional paper. Uh, and part of his findings in there were um, that rainfall intensity seemed to have something to do with initiation of uh, landslides that turned into uh, deadly debris flows. Uh, Russ also proposed some uh, early ideas about a landslide warning system that could be based on weather radar and and uh, uh, using this idea of, of intensity. Uh, in 1980, Nell Kane published his well-known paper on the intensity and duration uh, relationship. Uh, between precipitation and landslides. And then uh, later on, various people have proposed ideas related to hydrometeorological thresholds, where they proposed looking either at stream flow or other uh, hydrological measures in addition to the um, rainfall measures. And so, <clears throat> Some of these ideas that are still in use today with regards to landslide warning uh, have their origins in the early 1970s, early to mid 1970s and so forth. So uh, just wanted to mention that in connection with the zonation ideas that we're going to be talking about most of the time here. So let's look at some of the drivers for landslide zonation. Uh, 1952, uh, Los Angeles had some storms that uh, produced landslides to uh, development of a grading ordin ordinance, which was uh, later updated in 1963 uh, after they had some more storms and realized that uh, they needed to make some improvements. Um, the part of enforcing such an ordinance is knowing where it needs to apply. Um, 1969, uh, mud flows were added to the uh, uh, National Flood Insurance Program. And um, around the same time in New Zealand, uh, the idea of landslide insurance, and I have that in quotes uh, was developed. Uh, New Zealand had a national or has a national fund that was started after World War II to pay for um, recovery from uh, damages caused by the war. Uh, later uh, earthquakes were added to it. And then in 1970, um, they started funding uh, recovery from landslides as well. Uh, France had a uh, geologic hazards decree uh, requiring disclosure of geologic hazards uh, in relation to plans to occupy land. I couldn't find out the year, but Japan had a landslide prevention law. Austria passed a forestry law that had similar requirements to uh, um, what what was done in France in 1970. So there were these various uh, legal developments that uh, helped to motivate the need for for and, and use of um, landslide zonation in regulating land use or in um, helping to identify eligibility for uh, benefits such as the flood insurance program. Um, so uh, the earliest landslide susceptibility map that I was able to find uh, was published in 1959. It was a map 
uh, covering the uh, 48 United States, and um, it was based on uh, numbers of landslides, and the country was divided up according to uh, Neville Fenneman's um, physiographic regions of the United States. Um, another very early one from 1968, the abstract is depicted uh, there in the lower left. Uh, that was uh, California Divisions of Mine and Geology. A couple of geologists there uh, published a, an early map. Um, earliest known uh, probabilistic landslide susceptibility map was published in 1978. Um, I wasn't able to follow up on this suspicion, but I think it maybe was a forerunner of um, a probabilistic uh, program that was used by the Forest Service uh, later on. If I remember correctly, it was called LISA. Um, and then uh, 1984, uh, UNESCO published a uh, review of landslide hazard zonation. Um, most of the work was done actually in the late 1970s, but by the time the report was compiled and published, it came out in 1984. Um, David Barnes, formerly of the USGS, was the uh, lead on that project, and so he's credited as the author. An interesting side note is that uh, um, Dave was recognized by the French government and uh, awarded um, what translates into English as Knight in the Order of Academic Palms um, for this uh, work that led to the UNESCO publication. Uh, so um, it's definitely worthy of uh, reading. There's a lot that's still applicable today, even though the methods he describes are, are somewhat out of date. A lot of the principles are still uh, worth, um, worth reviewing. So, um, so I'm going to show some examples of some of these early maps. Um, now this the maps shown here are from an area in Cincinnati, Ohio, along the Ohio River. Uh, the mapping was done by a, a master's student uh, at the University of Cincinnati, uh, one of my classmates, and so this was in the early 1980s. Um, but it was based on a method that was developed at Stanford University in the uh, mid to late 1960s. Uh, the first map made according to this, uh, I think, was dated about 1968, at least the first one I've seen referenced. Um, so the process was to first uh, create an engineering geolo geologic map, which is depicted on the left. And so it shows the uh, geology, including the bedrock geology and the surficial geology uh, from an engineering geologic standpoint. Uh, and um, then it shows landslide features. Uh, other maps of this type might also show um, faults or uh, other geologic structures that could be important to the stability of the slopes. Uh, it also shows, shows evidence of uh, creep and uh, seepage. And you can see those features depicted on the map. So then the uh, landslide assessment is, is uh, depicted on the right, and it's a uh, map that classifies the ground into stable ground, potentially unstable ground, and moving ground. Um, and then further subdivided. And so this 
process, as you can imagine, required some uh, a lot of field work, and then the uh, interpretive map required quite a bit of uh, geologic and engineering judgment. Um, so now we'll go back to uh, Earl Brab's map, which we talked about briefly earlier. So we saw this on an earlier slide. Uh, so this was published in 1972. Uh, this is a different approach. Uh, it's more statistical in nature. Um, they had a landslide inventory. There was also a slope map and uh, a geologic map were used in developing this. Um, and so uh, this table describes the uh, the record of uh, landslides from the different geologic formations, which are shown in the uh, which are shown in, in this column. And um, then they used the density of landslides to, uh, or percent of area affected to subdivide it into different susceptibility classes. Um, and then based on the, uh, different slope intervals, uh, an area might get a lower or a higher uh, susceptibility ranking. Uh, so uh, this was quite a tedious process, as you might imagine, and um, but it was also uh, very systematic and not really a forerunner of, of many of the uh, statistical um, methods that are applied today, including some of the, the deep learning and, and other types of methods. It really, really comes down to counting densities of landslides and correlating it with uh, other data that you're able to collect. Um, and so, so you can see from the little blue rectangles that, for example, uh, zone five could consist of a number of different formations and different slope categories. Um, so that was that was the uh, one of the early forerunners of uh, various statistical types of mapping that we have today. Um, so uh, here we have kind of the uh, very earliest probabilistic assessment that uh, I was able to identify it was published in 1978 and was uh, done uh, up at Colorado State University in Fort Collins uh, under contract to the uh, Forest Service. And the study area was at the H.J. Andrews Experimental Forest in Oregon, where the USGS now has a, a uh, experimental with a free flow flow. Uh, just briefly about the methodology applied here. Um, you can see from the uh, uh, diagram here with the various dimensions and so forth labeled on it. Um, this approach uh, applied the infinite slope analysis. Uh, you can see the map over here on the right that the uh, uh, areas to which it was applied were fairly large. I don't know exactly what the pixel size was, but the uh, 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 computer graphics that were used are quite interesting. There's a different letter for the different uh, areas. So factor of safety less than or equal to one. Uh, Point two, we typed a bunch of W's in there. The printer put I's in the intermediate one, 
1.2 to 1.7 and then pack for safety greater than 1.7 it looks like a dot um so uh, they ran their model for uh, a lot of different scenarios different groundwater depths different uh, strength parameter values uh differences in how much um clear cutting was done and so forth so um so that's really the forerunner of of uh, probabilistic assessments that have been done in more recent times, even up to the present. Um, so uh, in in Barnes' uh, 1984 review, uh, he has a section about prince zonation principles. Uh, and they boil down to these. First, the past and present are keys to the future. Uh, that's really uh, going back to Charles Lyell with the uh, principle of uniformitarianism. It's just stated inversely. Uh, he said the present is the key to the past. So, uh, we're trying to make uh, geologic predictions so that we go the other direction. Uh, next, landslide causing conditions can be identified. Um, basic causes of landslides were already well known by 1950, as uh, suggested by this paper by Carl Terzaghi, published in 1950, part of the uh, um, GSA volume. And then uh, the idea that degrees of hazard can be estimated. And so um, this uh, diagram showing factor of safety and probability density uh, compares a couple of cases. Uh, the the uh, blue one with the narrow curve indicates uh, a very low mean and nominal factor of safety, also low uncertainty because it's narrow, and there's a low failure probability because the area below the factor of safety uh, equal to one is very small. For the red one, uh, mu much higher uncertainty, even though the factor of safety is higher, there's much higher uh, probability of failure for this one. So uh, being able to estimate the degrees of hazard was it was a principle that was recognized very early on and uh, still applies today. Well, let's talk a little bit about progress without going into any specifics. Uh, some of the things that have come along since those early, uh, we now have methods for validation of uh, susceptibility maps. Uh, we have new tools, uh, better tools for remote sensing, for computing, for uh, field data collection, so on. We have better data, more and better geologic maps better topographic data, more data about past landslides. And so those have led to uh, increased repeatability of, of, of the assessments, uh, being able to have other people, you know, different people uh, assess the same area and come up with similar results or being able to apply methods uh, in new er areas. Objectivity has been on the increase, I would say. Uh, I don't think it's uh, likely that uh, any method will ever become totally objective, but certainly uh, we can reach a, an acceptable standard of objectivity. And 
our ability to assess landslides has uh, and landslide hazard has expanded to uh, a wider variety of landslide processes and uh, the greater ability to assess the consequences such as uh, run out of landslides, for example. Uh, there are some continuing cha challenges, though. Uh, uncertainty, although we've been able to reduce some uncertainties, uh, others uh, persist and are likely to for a long time. Um, a lot of what's under the ground surface is uh, unknowable. Um, at least in the de detail that we'd like to know it. Um, slope is often a very good predictor of landslides, and even though we have some very sophisticated methods now and we have more data and so forth, uh, it's still challenging to uh, produce a map that does a better job than slope in predicting where landslides are going to occur. I, I know there are some uh, Exceptions to that, I'm well aware of some in uh, various places where uh, steeper slopes are not necessarily the more susceptible ones. Uh, but in many places, slope is, is hard to beat. Uh, another challenge is dealing with risk tolerance and uh, that really requires uh, a lot of interaction with the end users for our assessments, and um, they need to be well educated and well prepared to talk about those uh, concerns. Uh, so I'm going to briefly run through an example of an ongoing assessment. I don't have time to go into a lot of detail on this, but I'll, uh, Karina talked a little bit about some of this a couple of weeks ago. So uh, the project is in Puerto Rico and uh, doing an assessment for three uh, municipalities, Naranjito over here and then Ricardo and Lares. Um, and I'll just mention that there are some specific geologic terrains that uh, are of interest because they're the dominant ones in these areas. Granitoid rocks, there's a submarine basalt unit and then marine volcanic plastics. So that's um, those three rock types and soils developed on them are what we're dealing with mainly. So those are depicted here. Um, and uh, I want to talk just briefly about the workflow. So we conducted field studies, uh, also uh, did literature surveys to help compile data from a couple of different sources or from many different sources, I should say. Um, then there was a development stage where we were experimenting with um, some of our ideas for how to conduct the assessment and also doing some calibration work. Uh, and then final assessment, doing modeling and validation. Uh, model steps uh, involve modeling soil depth, uh, then uh, doing estimates of pressure head and um, one dimensional slope stability. So that was done with triggers uh, and then doing some quasi three dimensional slope stability analysis as the final step. Um, I'll just mention that the calibration involved all three of these. Uh, the uh, most of the work was focused on the soil depth models and on these slope stability. We had some interaction between these because uh, <clears throat> soil depth is maybe not uh, 
precise term. We were trying to model depths of uh, shallow landslides. We didn't actually go out and measure soil depth, but in most cases, soil depth was quite similar to the depth of the slides. And so um, that's really what we were modeling. And so there was some interaction between the slope stability modeling and the soil depth modeling to come up with depths that were um, going to give us the best predictions for uh, landslide locations. Um, so one of the earliest steps with uh, calibrating the um, strength parameters, we had some information from uh, field. We knew depths of a lot of these landslides. We also knew the slopes they occurred on. Uh, and we um, had some idea of ranges of uh, strength parameters. And so we ran a, a series of uh, models for dry conditions and for fully saturated conditions, used a synthetic uh, grid of uh, different slope angles and uh, depths and computed factor of safety for all of these. Um, so I'm showing a couple of different uh, parameter combinations in, in these four charts, and the upper ones are dry conditions, uh, zero pore pressure, and then the lower ones are pore pressure with water table with ground surface. Uh, taking all of these and then uh, finding which combinations were successful for um, our three different geologic terrains. Um, came up with these charts. And so for the granitoid terrain, um, those slides were generally very thin, shown by these green X's. And so we tended to have the highest success with uh, rather high friction angles and low cohesion. Um, other slide types tended to be, uh, tended to have more that were uh, as much as 15 meters deep. And so our um, results for those tended to have higher cohesion and uh, somewhat lower angles of friction, but still fairly high because the slopes were quite steep there. Uh, here's an example. Here are some examples of our soil model. This is for a small test area in Naranjito. Uh, and so the little squares show uh, kind of a comparison between these were kind of our four best models for soil depth. Uh, I had a graduate student from the, uh, from the Colorado School of Mines who did the calibration exercises for me. Um, and uh, his name is Matt Tello. Um, so anyway, these were our, our best estimates on what the soil depths looked like. Um, and uh, then for these different ones, this is the one dimensional factor of safety. Uh, got some kind of surprising results. Overall, our best performing model for um, landslide susceptibility turned out to be uh, this one, which uh, assumed a constant average depth for the soil and um, 1D slope stability analysis. And so it had an area under the curve of, I think, about 0.88. Uh, but close behind were these other well-performing models, um, which we prefer because we think the soil depths are a little more true to what we actually see in the field. Um, so even though they didn't give quite as good a result as the constant depth, they're still very good. Um, and then the quasi-3D method, so we use a, 
kind of a something sort of like a sliding gold pan uh, to represent our uh, failure surface. And we try it at the center of each grid cell throughout the digital elevation model. Results are shown over here, again, for our calibration area. We had one other uh, parameter, and that's the, kind of the size of the search uh, or of the trial surface. Uh, and let's see here. Here, uh, the bottom one and the top one compare the same soil model, but with different radii for the uh, trial surface. Uh, the larger trial surface gives uh, maybe a prettier map, but um, it does not perform as well. So it's the uh, curve is shown by the blue one and then the Brown one is up here at the top. That's our best performing model, which is up here. Um, and so the uh, area under the curve was uh, somewhat less for these, closer to about 0.8 for the best performing one, compared to a uh, higher value on the one dimensional factor safety. Um, but I'll show you here a close up to compare these. Uh, why we prefer the uh, quasi three dimensional um, output. The uh, you can see the edges of these zones using the one dimensional factor of safety are quite ragged. Uh, it's very hard to regulate uh, land use with something like that. Having uh, smoother boundaries to the zones with uh, high landslide susceptibility um, is uh, much easier to use in a, a regulatory or planning uh, situation. And so, so we prefer that even though the uh, uh, performance metrics are slightly less. Uh, okay, so just to wrap up now with some closing thoughts. So we've seen these early uh, landslide zonation principles uh, are still still valid. This idea of, of uniform uniformitarianism, um, or that we can use past and, and present conditions to um, predict what's likely in the future. Um, the causes are known, although we continue learning more about that. Uh, they're definitely capable of being determined in, mo in nearly every case. Uh, and uh, we can make estimates of uh, hazard and we can assess which areas are more hazardous than others. Uh, we've also seen that uh, uh, new tools can add value to our assessments. Uh, they can extend our vision and capacity and certainly reduce uh, error from uh, the days when we did things manually and uh, TDM as well. Um, so I think we have some opportunities for innovation. Uh, and I think we have some opportunities to uh, uh, take risk into consideration a little bit more in our uh, assessments. Um, so <clears throat> this slide um, is rather busy. Um, but it um, it shows uh, some information about uh, landslides or landslide areas that I have known. Um, 
So these are all in the United States. And um, some of them are larger metropolitan areas, and some are uh, more rural areas uh, or maybe single landslides. Um, so, uh, so we see a wide range here. Now I want to mention something about these two red lines. Um, so if you look in the uh, uh, in Schuster and Kreisick's uh, book on uh, landslide investigation and mitigation, there's a chapter in there by uh, Wu and others about uh, hazard and risk assessment. And they've got a chart in there that um, they um, reproduced from another publication, which shows uh, levels of acceptable risk um, for various activities, including um, open pit mine slopes and and what have you. Uh, and so those red lines are taken from from that chart. So uh, accepted risk and marginally accepted risk in various uh, engineering endeavors. Um, and so based on information I had about uh, likely range of annual probabilities for landslides, these various locations, uh, you get the vertical error bars, horizontal ones have to do with consequences, and they're based either on uh, lives lost or on uh, cost in dollars or some combination thereof. Um, and uh, I just used the scaling from their chart. I don't really believe it's possible to put a dollar value on a human life, but uh, that's that's the scale that they were using. So I. I've used their scale, except I've updated it to $2,020. Um, so I think we have opportunity as we go into areas, do assessments to uh, identify um, zones with the, the greatest hazard and uh, hopefully uh, separate those from areas with lower hazard. So these, uh, so the purple here shows Seattle. And then uh, the purple squares along here show uh, zones that uh, Bill Schultz mapped. Um, we did our assessment of uh, landslide susceptibility uh, several years ago, and uh, his zones can clearly separate um, areas with acceptable risk from those that have unacceptable risk. Uh, in that particular case, it's a relative, the Areas with unacceptable risk are relatively small, and so that's an ideal we want to strive for. But uh, in cases like uh, Puerto Rico that I was just showing you, because there is so much mountainous area, uh, that area uh, of unacceptable risk is much larger. Um, I just want to conclude with a few cautions. We've got a lot of great tools, a lot of tech, great technologies available to us and new developments. Um, but I, I hope that we don't let our enthusiasm for those uh, take us away from uh, doing field work and staying in touch with, with the actual processes going on. Modeling and remote sensing are no substitute for field work. Uh, computer models, no matter how sophisticated they are, are only as good as the data that we put into them. And 
Finally, uh, just because things are correlated doesn't mean that there's uh, actual causation involved. And so uh, I hope that we can always keep those in mind going forward so that we can uh, keep our assessments relevant and accurate and, and meaningful. Uh, I just want to close with uh, Dave Barnes uh, recipe for success in doing success, doing assessments. Uh, this is from a section titled uh, something about operational principles. Uh, so defining our purpose, letting the purpose and the processes, meaning the landslide process is find what should be done. Identifying and involving the users. Uh, and uh, doing the investigation in phases and using the best skills and best uh, tools attainable. Uh, I think if we keep those things in mind, we can be successful in the future. Thank you.